So welcome, ladies and gentlemen. We are studying the words of Rav Shemshin Pincus on Pesach. And I went through a couple different of Rabbi Pincus's um, Divrei Torah or chapters on the holiday of Passover. And I found something which I think we're all going to truly enjoy and appreciate. And he starts off with a question. He says, the mitzvahs on Passover, the obligations that we have on Passover are very different than every other holiday. The Seder night is full of mitzvot that revolve around eating. So besides for telling over the story of the Exodus, most of it is all about eating and drinking. Leaning, eating matzah, eating maro, or the sandwich, the the, the, the drinking of the wine, the, the, the karpas, washing hands, everything about eating and eating and eating and eating, the whole observance of the holiday all takes place at the Seder table. In contrast to other holidays, let's just take an example, Rosh Hashanah. Rosh Hashanah, we are obligated to blow a shofar. On Sukkot, we enter a sukkah. There's different holidays that we have different things to do, but Passover is eating and drinking. Why is it revolved around this eating and drinking? So, Rab Pinka says, in order to understand this properly, we have to understand the concept and further the power of what eating is. Now, if I recall correctly, it may have been last year, we've touched upon this topic in one of our other classes. I don't remember exactly which one it was. And... So if we find that class, it's nice to, to draw it back to it. I think I know where it was. It was by Yaakov and Esav, well, really Yitzchak. Yitzchak asking Esav to bring him a meal before he blesses him. That's where it was. I don't know if it was this year we spoke about it or last year. Why then? Why was, was, was Yitzchak so worried about or... Or wanted specifically Asaph to serve him food before giving him the blessing. So this question that we're going to answer now is also going to answer that. The Zohar tells us, let's we'll just put that on the side for a second with Yitzchak, because I don't want to get you off track, but that's where we learned this in Reb Pincus. It's nice to just draw the connections when it's the same chidush, the same novelty, and it's applicable in many areas, as we'll see right now. The Zohar says that man, the wonder bread, did not fall on Shabbat. We know there was a double portion on, on Friday. It fell for Friday and Shabbat. But it, was not, it did not fall on Shabbat. The, the Zohar says the reason for this is because Shabbat was blessed. Blessed? Why does it have, why does it have man then? The Zohar explains, because all of the blessings of the sixth day, come, of the six days of the week, sorry, come from Shabbat. Shabbat is the source of all blessings. Mekor kol abrachot. It's the source of all blessings. Okay. Rupinka explains what this means because, okay, very nice to say, but how does that really make sense? He says, he answers, he explains it with a mashal, an anecdote, a story. Imagine you come to a grocery store and it's closed. So you start knocking on the window and you ask, why is the store closed? Is there no food left? So... The manager comes to the front and he tells you, of course, there's food left, but we just received a large shipment and we're now restocking and organizing the store and filling up the shelves with all the food. And you'll have to come back at another time. Meaning, Rapinka says, the fact that the store is closed doesn't mean that the store is empty. It rather means it's closed so it's able to provide more for the customers. And the lesson is clear. The Zohar is telling us that Shabbat provides blessing for the entire week. It can't have man that comes down on that day also. It needs to fill up in blessing in order that it can distribute blessing to the rest of the week. The Zohar now continues and says, Therefore, Anyone who is a Baal Emuna, person who is a true believer in Hashem, that he is the provider, 
should make sure to set their table and prepare a meal on it for Shabbat, specifically for Friday night. That this way the table in your home will be blessed and there will be food on that table in order for blessing to set in. Because blessing cannot set in unless you make a, a kli, a vessel, a receptacle for it. The Vessel for blessing for Parnassah in your home is preparing your Shabbat table and having food and bread on that table. So now he asks another question. He says, if we understand this as such, why does the blessing of our week depend on how we have or how we prepare for mealtime on Shabbat? Again, why does it have to do with the meal? So now, Rev. Pincus explains a famous concept, which this is the concept we learned by Yitzchak asking Esav, that eating is a unique and special phenomenon. The reason why Rev. Pincus says is because we feel God's blessing immediately. It's from hunger and weakness we right away feel satiated and rejuvenated. Eating is unlike any other healing or making a livelihood, which take time. Eating is the direct connection with God. And it's where one is able to feel and locate God's blessing in the most obvious manner. He then continues and says, all aspects of life, could be gathered and stored away. Money, food, air, oxygen, water. You could put it in a container and save it for later. But the only thing you can't store some for later is life itself. You can't save life. It's not a video game where you have stars and you could just keep it for later. We can grasp anything in our lives except for life itself. And the very reason is because God himself is the one who provides life on a constant basis. And at any moment, God can say, that's it. He holds the key to our life. When we receive the gift of life from God, we can connect to him most. Rav Pinka says, since when we eat, it's most apparent and obvious. It's the most apparent and obvious way to see God's blessing in our lives. Mealtime, therefore, is the most opportune time to connect to Hashem. With this, we can answer why Yitzchak wanted Esav to, bring, to serve him food, a meal, before he blessed him. He could have just blessed him on the spot. But he wanted to connect to Hashem in a stronger way when he's able to experience Hashem with a delightful meal and then bless his son. So now coming back to us, a great sign of this concept, that this concept of mealtime or eating is, is, is the most strong way to connect to Hashem, falls within a very common rule. The rule is as follows, and I'm translating into English, that... The greater something is, the more it can destroy. Let's talk about fire for a moment. Fire is one of the most amazing creations ever. It has the ability to light up, to heat, to cook, but all within measure. If not proper, it's not used properly, it can burn down something. It can destroy in the most catastrophic ways. So eating... Is just like that. Eating like all great things has two sides to the coin. One side is the ability to connect to Hashem in a way like no other. But the other side is eating can be something with which distances a person from God like no other as well. As we read in our Torah, Vaishman Yishun, Vaivat Moshe Rabbeinu warns the Jewish people, don't get too satiated and fattened from eating, because when that happens, you'll kick back. Eating could be looked at as 
the gr most great and obvious gift from God. Yet the nature of a human being is to not be grateful. And to not be grateful even to God because being grateful and expressing gratitude puts a person in a position of vulnerability. No one likes to feel vulnerable, even towards Hashem. So instead of, of admitting that God is the one who provided, it's very common nature or human nature for a person to kick back and deny any of God's involvement in, in you getting this food. Also, a person may just forget to see God's hand in the food that they eat and in being satiated because it's so common. It's so easy for us. We're always eating. Especially nowadays, we take it for granted. We have so much. It's, it's the generation of plenty. We've never felt hungry. The hungriest we felt is on Yom Kippur or Tish above. But even then, you're not so hungry. Why? Because you know where your next meal is. None of us ever had to skip a meal. So it's very hard for us to, to connect and say, oh, it's Hashem that provided it for us. That's our avoda. That's, that's the service. That's what we have to work towards. But when a person's mindful, eating again can be the most powerful connector to Hashem. So let's go back to the Zohar. This is what the Zohar meant, that a Baal Imuna, a person of great belief in God, has to feel that their blessing comes from God. And when's the time to do that? When it's coming in its most obvious way. So just like the person believes that the money that they have doesn't come from the bank, it doesn't come from their job or their employer, comes from Hashem, we have to believe that the blessing that we have comes from Shabbat. When I say Shabbat, it's Shabbat observance. It's preparing for Shabbat and enjoying Shabbat and keeping Shabbat. The blessing needs to be recognized and hastened on Shabbat when it comes at the at immediate moment. And when is the moment that the blessing comes down on Shabbat? Meal time. Because that's the greatest opportunity to connect to God. When you're eating, that's the biggest time. The biggest time on Shabbat. That also explains why mealtime could often go, go sideways. That's why people could speak Lashon Hara. There could be family fighting. There could be disputes. <laughs> why is it always mealtime? You ever thought why? Because the Yetzirah is working overtime, double time, triple time then. Because he doesn't want to let you connect on the highest level. But mealtime is the most powerful time on Shabbat. That's the moment the blessing comes. That's when you want to hasten it. That's when you want to grab it. Because then you're going to realize that that is what's the, being filled up for the entire week to come. So let's go back to Passover. Passover is the birthday of the Jewish nation. And therefore, we can compare Passover for B'nai Israel to birth of a baby. And if Passover, the exodus itself, was the birth, when was the pregnancy stage? While the Jewish people were in Egypt. And just as when a baby spends the time in its mother's womb, the, the fetus is completely dependent on the mother. The mother goes somewhere, the baby goes along with, the fetus goes along with. The mother eats what the, ch the child eats, what the mother eats. There's no separating. It's completely dependent. If we would look at the state of the Jewish people in Egypt, we can evaluate a very important fact. You see, back then, the entire world was completely dependent on fields, on what the fields produced, because that's all they ate. There was no storing and freezing and shipping and importing and exporting at the way we understand it today. It was much more simple. It was field to table as much as possible. And for that reason, people would, all nations of the world, when they would wake up in the morning, guess what they would do? They would look up in the skies and see if it's going to rain today. 
because that's all they cared about. They wanted it to rain so their crop will grow. Their eyes were always up towards Shemaim, towards the heavens. Whether they believed in nature, they believed in God, they believed in their own God, but they were dependent on something. Egypt was different. Because Egypt, the country, is positioned on the Nile River. The Nile River provides water for most of the fields in Egypt, if not all. Especially with their, back in the day, upgraded irrigation systems. The Egyptian woke up in the morning, didn't look up at Shemaim, didn't look for hope, just looked straight at the field. It was natural. It was expected. It was obvious that the food's going to be there. Rarely did they ever have a hungry patch. Right? Of course, the two years that Joseph predicted to Paro. But very, very, very seldom did they ever lack anything. That's why they were the powerhouse of the world. Because there was an abundance there. But that comes with a negativity. The negativity is that they were completely independent and only fixated on the nature of it just being there all the time. We have to realize that that was a civilization that B'nai Israel were in for 210 years. This is what they were raised in. Even though they were enslaved, look at this. Look at the the, um, psychology of the human brain. Even though the Jew was a slave, they obviously were impacted by the Egyptians, but they still lived a life based on nature, based on depending on nature, and based on depending on it's always going to be there. There's always going to be grain. Just like a fetus that eats anything that the mother eats. It's always there. The food will always be there. The Nile was always there. Now when B'nai Israel were freed from Egypt and they were born, they now separated from their source of nature from Egypt. And now they were independent in some way. They changed from being a people who lived based and relying on nature to now relying on God. They went from being based on looking at the field in the Nile to looking up at Shemaim, at the heavens, at God. When a baby is born, it takes time before they could live on their own and fend for themselves. And it comes in stages and processes. As time passes, the baby is able to do more and more for themselves. If Pesach is the birth of the Jewish people, when the baby is born, then very soon after the Jewish people had to eat. Get ready, this is amazing. When a baby comes out of his mother's womb, baby's brought onto the mother's body, and then very short after, nurses. What did the Jewish people nurse on after they were born? What was the very first thing they ate? It was not the man. It was matzah. Matzah was what they ate on their way out. It's like they were coming out of the womb. They were coming out of Egypt. And they ate matzah. Says Rav Pincus. What does that signify? What does that mean? It was a display of the Jewish people. First of all, being commanded to eat that matzah. Not only then, but every year afterwards. But why matzah? Because matzah is a food of mitzvah. That's why, by the way, the words are very, very similar. Matzah and mitzvah. Very, very similar. It's the ultimate way to connect to God. Through eating matzah. That's why the Zohar refers to matzah as nahama de mehemnuta. Nahama in Aramaic means bread. Memnuta is of 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 tr- of emuna, of belief. When we eat matzah, we are boosting up our vitamin E, vitamin emuna. When the Jewish people left Egypt, they ate the matzah first. It was a display of our life and energy comes from you, God, only from you. 
So on Passover, when we eat matzah, what we're doing is we're proclaiming that we're not chametz. Chametz is nature. It's natural to eat bread. Chametz is not something that's prohibited to eat all year long. It's not like eating pig. It's that animals eat, dogs eat dog food, let's say, right? And, and reptiles eat mice. And mankind eats bread, eats rolls. It's our mainstay. It's kosher. But it depicts a life of nature. It, de it depicts a regular life. Opposed to matzah being the first food the Jewish people ate when they were born, when we were commanded to eat it. So every year at that time when we were commanded to eat it, we eat it again. And we remind ourselves of the ability to connect to God through eating. Specifically, through eating with the intention of connecting to Hashem. So it can be, and it's supposed to be, an experience of connecting to Hashem directly. Matzah is re-eaten every year to remind us of the very first thing we ate when we were born. So it's, it's, it's very, very interesting because scientifically we know that when a child is born, the first milk, so to say, that the, that the baby suckles on is not really, really milk. It, it changes with time. I, I don't even know what the word is, but it's, it's a very, very thin fluid that is just there to, to soothe the baby. And then as the baby grows, the mother's diet also may change, but really her body evolves and changes and is able to provide for the child what the child needs. But that very, very first time the child, the infant, suckles from his or her mother is a very specific type of, we'll call it milk, we'll call it fluid, whatever it may be. This is what we do on a yearly basis. We're able to relive, react, reconnect to the whole concept of eating, which is very hard on Passover through going back to the basic, simple flour and water. There you go. That's the word, colostrum. Very good. I knew that was the word. Thank you, Eileen. Thank you, Ron. Thank you, Eileen. Because we have that opportunity on Passover to reconnect, we have to hasten that opportunity. It's because it's a whole new outlook to matzah. Number one, eating is a way, the greatest way to connect to Hashem. We see this from Shabbat. And number two is why do we eat the matzah on Passover besides for Hashem commanding us to eat it? Is because that was the first food we ate and we want to eat it again to remind us that our power, our energy, our life all comes from Hashem. Let this be an intention while we're eating our matzah, reclining, chowing that matzah down, and be'ezrat Hashem, we will be able to embody this idea. And that's what it means, that it's the bread of our emuna, bread of our faith. Because when you eat it and you realize this is the first thing, and this is the basic way to connect to Hashem through eating, that should be what it does for us. So B'zat Hashem, Hashem will bless us that we will be able to achieve that level through eating the matzah, and hopefully let that spill over to all of our eating all year long. Amen v'amen.